Good morning, everyone. I want to start today by asking you a question. How smart are you? Think about how you would answer me. You might want to reply with a number or something we could measure. For example, you might tell me your IQ, that is, your intelligence quotient. You might also give your grade point average, your GPA. But now, what if I asked you, how are you smart? What would you say to that question? I'd say I'm good with people. And I'm smart in the football field. <laughs> <laughs> good answers. You have two different types of intelligence interpersonal, which is how you deal with other people, and bodily, which is how you move. This is basically the idea of a theory called multiple intelligences. First, though, a bit of history. As education majors, you all know about the IQ test, the intelligence quotient test, which was created by Alfred Binet in 1905 for the purposes of prediction and placement. Binet wanted a way to predict how well students would do in school and place them in the right classes. However, the IQ test was often used to exclude students, to keep the below average students out of regular schools. One psychologist, Howard Gardner, had another problem with the IQ test. How many of you have taken an IQ test? Oh, a little less than half. Can you tell us what type of questions were asked in the test? Um, math, logic, words. Good. These are exactly the subjects you learn in school, aren't they? Gardner's argument was that not everyone is book smart, meaning good at school subjects. He suggested that there are types of intelligence that the IQ test does not test. Gardner said there were eight intelligences in total language, logical, visual, musical, bodily, and natural, plus two emotional intelligences. Interpersonal, how you interact with other people, and finally, intrapersonal, how well you know yourself. So, what is an intelligence? Gardner defines an intelligence as the ability to solve problems by finding or creating new solutions, and the ability to create something valuable in your culture. Your example of being sports smart fits the definition. You try to solve the problem of moving a football in order to win games, which the culture of colleges in the U.S. thinks is a good thing. The same is true of musicians, painters, scientists, and of course for the students who get an A in my class. <laughs> I have a question, Professor. How does Gardner know there are eight intelligences? Why not nine or ten or twenty five? That's a good question, and it's the biggest problem with his theory. It's hard to decide what is and what isn't an intelligence. Gardner says that an intelligence must have stages of development and a clear end state, that is, a level that makes you an expert. For example, when you're learning a foreign language, you develop your skills, and your goal is to become fluent. Then you're an expert, correct? So language is an intelligence. Okay, now although there are problems with the theory, it's still useful for you as future teachers. Everyone is smart in different ways. We're all born with different levels in each intelligence, and we can all improve any of these intelligences, even those we're naturally weak in. So it's a very positive theory. So, how can we use the theory of multiple intelligences in our classes as teachers? Well, my advice is to ask your students some simple questions so that you can find out their strong and weak intelligences. You can then use that information in your lesson preparation. Use your students' strong intelligences to help develop their weaker intelligences. I'm not sure I understand. Okay. Say you're teaching a language and you have certain students who have strong musical intelligence. Then you might use songs as part of the language practice. 
Another use of multiple intelligences is just to talk with your students about their strong and weak intelligences. This teaches them to value different abilities, different intelligences, and that can create a better atmosphere in the classroom because students will have more respect for each other. Any other questions so far? Yes. Today on the Natural World, we're profiling the naturalist Marjorie Courtney Latimer, who passed away on May seventeenth, two thousand four, at the age of ninety-seven. Marjorie Courtney Latimer was the naturalist who discovered an extremely rare fish called the coelacanth in nineteen thirty-eight and introduced it to the scientific world. With us is Dr. Jennifer White, a biologist from New Haven, Connecticut. She's going to talk about Latimer's discovery. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Well, Ms. Courtney Latimer was a really wonderful woman, and she lived a long and interesting life. She was the curator of a small museum in the town of East London in South Africa, and during her life, she collected many, many kinds of animals. But her discovery of a coelacanth was truly amazing. Tell us what she found. Well, the year was 1938. She had an agreement with a local fisherman that she could look through his catch. That is the fish that he caught during the day, and if the fisherman caught anything interesting, she was allowed to take it for her museum. So one day she went down and she looked through the pile of fish and found nothing. Just as she was leaving, she saw an unusual shaped blue-colored fin poking out of the pile. She pushed away the rest of the fish and pulled this large blue fish out. Right away, she knew that this fish was different. She asked to take it back to her museum. Apparently, she had a hard time convincing a taxi driver to let her bring this five-foot dead fish in the car. Did Marjorie know what she had found? Did she realize how important her discovery was? Well, she knew it was something special, but she didn't know what. When she got back to her lab, she couldn't find anything like it in her books. She wondered if it might be a coelacanth, but the idea seemed impossible. According to her books, the coelacanth no longer existed. They'd been extinct for sixty-five million years. She wrote to Dr. Smith, a professor interested in ichthyology—that's the study of fish—to see what he thought. She drew a little picture and described it as a hundred and twenty-seven pound fish with thick scales and fins that look like arms and legs. She wrote that there was no skeleton, but that there was a soft oil-filled tube in its back. What did the professor say? He was very excited when he got the letter, and he came down to see the fish, and he decided that it was, in fact, a coelacanth. He named it Latimeria columni after Marjorie Latimer and columni because that was the name of the river near where it was found. Tell us what a coelacanth is and why it might be important. Well,、uh, coelacanth fossils are dated to as much as four hundred million years ago. So coelacanth are even older than the dinosaurs. They seem to have disappeared around the same time as dinosaurs, about sixty-five million years ago. It's just incredible that an animal assumed to be long gone could actually still be living. The coelacanth is a very strange fish, though. It's got some things that are quite different from modern fish. For instance, it has a jelly-filled organ called a rostral organ. This is the only living creature with this organ. It also has an incredibly small brain, smaller than any other animal we know of. I suppose the small brain size hasn't hurt the fish, since the coelacanth has clearly survived for millions of years. So, do coelacanths only live off the coast of Africa? Well, we thought so until not too long ago. In 1998, an American couple was on their honeymoon in Indonesia when they found a coelacanth at a fish market there. Instead of the blue color, as the fish around Africa were, this fish was brownish gold colored. Again, it was an amazing discovery. Scientists offered a small reward for coelacanth, and asked to be notified if a fisherman ever caught one. Ten months later, they were told of a coelacanth that was actually still alive. They had a chance to swim next to it before it died. Incredible. Thank you so much for sharing this story of an amazing fish and the woman who first discovered it. I want to let our listeners know that there are now organizations to help save the coelacanth from being killed by fishermen. Instead of finding new coelacanths for research, we are trying to preserve the ones that are alive.